pleasure to welcome you back to the third Coaston Lecture. The uh, requirements of the Coaston Lecture, the idea of it was to have three uh, successive le lectures in an, in an afternoon um, by an eminent theologian, so check. <laughs> Our final one today, where you're gonna sum it all up for us, um, we are very much looking forward to. And I have to say, um, this has just transformed my own week and my month here at Virginia Seminary, and I'm gonna be disappointed next, tomorrow at 4.30, when I can't join you here and listen to more of what you have to say. Now, to introduce you, we're gonna have one of our own eminent theologians here on campus, Dr. Kate Sonderegger, the William Mead Professor of Systematic Theology. No one who has read David Bentley Hart's work will be surprised at the sustained intellectual rigor, the power and theological passion of the lectures we have heard at Virginia Seminary this week. Professor Hart has brought us deep inside his vision of Christian theology, a broad and good land, rich in harvest, well worth fighting for. This week's lectures have offered a vigorous defense of universal salvation through Christ, forcefully argued, and undergirded by fresh translation and exegesis of Holy Scripture. Throughout, Professor Hart has quietly relied upon the elixir that is Gregory of Nyssa. <laughs> and that will not surprise his faithful readers either. With the Anglican theologian Sarah Coakley, Professor Hart has brought Gregory to the forefront of theological attention. And we are deeply grateful to this gift to the whole church. The retrieval and exposition of the theology of Gregory of Nyssa has been the work of Professor Hart's whole scholarly career. As an enticement to our lecture this afternoon, and to a renewed attention to Professor Hart's early work, I close with an eloquent section from The Beauty of the Infinite, which is this wonderful book. I quote Professor Hart. Gregory speaks of the perfection of human nature as a growth without achievable limit because it is growth in the presence of the infinite. Moreover, this presence is an infinite deferral, but not the deferral of absence, alienation, or violence. It is delight, blessing, ceaseless approach, endless rapture. Gregory depicts the state of the soul that has passed beyond the possibility of relapse into sin as pure succession, pure repetition, divided no longer between memory and hope, past and future. It will be a sheer futurity in which the soul, forgetful of what has gone before because the previous state has been subsumed into the ever greater reality of the present, will still remain intent upon the yet greater beauty which lies ahead. This is indeed an account of Exodus, but also of deification. When the bridegroom calls to the soul, writes Gregory, she is refashioned into the yet more divine and by a beneficent change, changed from her glory to one still more exalted. For whosoever thirsts for participation in God drinks of the divine fountain without ever being sated, because this fountain transforms itself, transforms into itself the one who takes it in and endows him with a share of its own power. So we too are eager for the beauty that lies ahead. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hart to our podium. Oh, 
Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, the introduction was so splendid now that I fear uh, the best I can do is disappoint. Uh, <clears throat> so I'd better get to it. Um, so thank you very much. It was very graceful. I, I, I haven't read that book myself in some years, but, but uh, you give me a, a desire to do so again. <laughs> Oh, well, good. Well, I have a certain admiration for the author, uh, but uh, thank you. I'm going to be a little bit more subdued today uh, than on the previous two days, just because I'm not feeling quite as uh, chipper. Uh, the uh, health condition I mentioned has a, a capricious habit of reasserting itself as it will, um, especially on days of high humidity. Um, but... Uh, let me just say before I begin, it's been a lovely visit here. Uh, I love the campus. The people have been gracious uh, to a fault or gracious in a way that I can only describe as Episcopalian. Um, part of my secret past is that I once was a member of that tribe. I didn't leave it in anger or... or uh, 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 repudiation as some people move from one communion to another, but because the high Anglican tradition in which I was raised had so immersed me in the Eastern patristic heritage that I was always drawn east, eastward from an early age. But <clears throat> in terms of sheer sensibility, I have to admit I'm very much uh, an Anglican Orthodox and uh, still pray the Psalms uh, from the old bishop's psalter. Uh, so, I'll begin with a quotation from Pascal. Uh, well, it begins all, immediately with a difficult word, cet écoulement, uh, this transmission, this flowing out. He's talking about original sin. Um, appears to us not only impossible, it seems indeed very unjust, for what is there more contrary to the rules of our miserable justice than eternally to damn an infant incapable of will for a sin whereof he appears to have us part so small that it was committed 6,000 years before he was in existence? Certainly nothing offends us more basically than this doctrine, and yet without this mystery, the most incomprehensible of all, we are incomprehensible to ourselves." The knot of our condition takes its twists and turns. Replie, um, c'est tour. In in this abyss, in such a way that the human being is more inconceivable without this mystery than this mystery is inconceivable to the human being. Unquote. It's from <clears throat> the Pensee. Now, this is of course entirely backwards. Generally, there's something deeply attractive in Pascal's cosmic despair, with its uh, plangent melancholy and occasional ghastly sublimity. But whenever one catches a glimpse of the specific doctrinal commitment sustaining that despair, the picture can lose its enchanting pathos uh, and become something somewhat more morbid. Uh, I mean, I love Pascal, but... Uh, he was a Jansenist after all. <laughs> For me, this passage offers uh, an exquisite specimen of the way in which Christians down the centuries uh, have excelled at converting the good tidings of God's love in Christ into something dreadful, something even morally hideous. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and it's difficult not to admire the sheer ingenuity of the contortions of reasons by of reason by which having arrived at dogmatic commitments that have no basis in conscience, many Christians have had to strive to make the abominable, if not palatable, at least seem vaguely reasonable. They tell themselves, for instance, we tell ourselves that eternal torment is the condign penalty for any sin as the gravity of the transgression must be measured by the dignity of the one wronged, and God is infinite. This is one, of course, one of the uh, responses I've had in uh, recent months to this project of mine, this very traditional uh, argument being made at me on the internet or to me in unsolicited emails. 
which I receive with a smile and a press of the delete button. Of course, there's a kind of nonsense here. Well, you can't answer them all, you know. Guilt's proportion is not an objective quantity, but an evaluation. And a very questionable justice indeed would refuse to assign guilt according to the capacities and knowledge of the transgressor. Or Christians have told themselves that the revelation of God's sovereign glory in dereliction and redemption is a good surpassing every other. But of course, a glory revealed by cruelty or vengeance is no glory at all. And so on. There are times when it is difficult not to think that Christianity must be the only theistic creed that spends so much time in joining its adherents to be morally superior to the God it describes. And I suspect that no figure in Christian history has suffered a greater injustice as a result of this desperate invent inventiveness of the Christian moral imagination than the Apostle Paul since it was the misprision of his theology of grace, starting again, alas, with the late Augustine and what I do like to think of as his declining years. Though he was rather brilliant during those declining years, but, you know, these things go back and forth. But it was uh, this misreading of Paul that prompted the vast majority of these, what I take to be distortions of the gospel, uh, aboriginal guilt, predestination, anti prives emerita, the eternal damnation of unbaptized infants, uh, the, real experience, the real existence of vessels of wrath, I'll get to that in a moment, and so on. All these notions and others equally uh, unpleasant have been ascribed to Paul, and yet each of these dogmatic leitmotifs, so to speak, is actually an inversion of the guiding themes of Paul's proclamation of Christ's triumph and of God's purpose in election. I'm beginning in this way, by the way, I should mention, because it is again uh, Gregory of Nyssa who will win the argument by the end of the, the uh, lecture. Uh, but during my translation of uh, the New Testament, I became aware, as I had not before, how uh, fine an exegete specifically of Paul Gregory was because again, I had read Gregory for Gregory's theology and had not paid sufficient attention to just how brilliantly Gregory was reading scripture. Consider for instance, Romans chapter, not chapters nine to 11, which for Augustinian tradition is the locus classicus of his theology of grace. From very early on in Western Christian history, these admittedly complex but hardly hermetic pages came to be misread in two crucial ways. Firstly, as an argument regarding the eternal discrete destinies of individual souls. And secondly, as a collection of declamatory statements rather than a continuous discourse upon a single and largely hypothetical question. And the result was deeply unfortunate. To be honest, Paul's argument in those chapters isn't difficult to follow, at least not for a reader who doesn't begin from defective premises. What preoccupies Paul, and I think we all know this, but I'm sure we've all studied these chapters, I hope, is the agonizing mystery that the Messiah has come, in his view, and yet so few of the house of Israel seem to be accepting him, while many from outside the covenant now are doing so. What then of God's faithfulness to his promises? God's, Paul's question, I should say, isn't an abstract one regarding who is saved and who damned. In fact, by the end of the argument, the former category proves to be vastly larger than that of the elect or the called. He's quite explicit about that. While the latter category fails to make any appearance at all. His is a concrete question concerning Israel and the church. And ultimately, he arrives at an answer drawn ingeniously from the logic of election in Hebrew scripture. Before that, however, in a completely and explicitly conditional voice, he limbs the problem in the starkest chiaroscuro. We know, he says, that divine election is God's work alone, not earned but given. It is not by their merit that Gentile believers have been chosen. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. But here, recall, quoting Malachi, for whom Jacob symbolizes Israel, 
and Esau symbolizes Edom. For his own ends, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He has mercy on whom he will, hardens whom he will. If you think this unjust, who are you, O man, to reproach the God who made you? May not the potter cast his clay for purposes, both high and low, as he chooses. So, quote, then, what if, either, God should show his power by preparing vessels of wrath solely for destruction, to provide an instructive counterpoint to the riches of the glory he lavishes on vessels prepared for mercy, whom he has called from among the Jews and the Gentiles alike. And perhaps that's simply how it is. The elect alone are to be saved, and the rest left reprobate as a display of divine might. God's faithfulness is his own affair. Well, so far, so Augustinian. But so also, again, purely conditional. What if, either? Rather than offering a solution to the quandary that torments Paul, uh, he's simply restating it in its bleakest possible form at the very brink of despair. But he does not stop there. This is not the correct answer. Rather, he continues to question God's justice despite his own perhaps ironic warning against such presumption and then spends the next two chapters unambiguously rejecting this provisional answer altogether in search of a completely different and far more glorious conclusion. Throughout the book of Genesis, I mean, I I think it's curious how little attention we pay to Paul's use of the quotation from Malachi, but also to specifically the figures of Jacob and Esau. Throughout the book of Genesis, the pattern of God's election is persistently, even perversely, antinomian. Ever and again, the elder to whom the birthright properly belongs is supplanted by the younger, whom God has chosen in defiance of all natural justice. This is practically the running motif uniting the whole text from the story of Cain and Abel to that of Manasseh and Ephraim. But, and this is crucial, the pattern is one not of exclusion and inclusion, but of a providential delay and divagation of the natural justice of primogeniture, one that immensely widens the scope of election, taking in the brother justly excluded by the law, or who would have been justly excluded by the law of primogeniture, but in such a way as to redound to the good of the brother unjustly and temporarily pretermitted. This is clearest in the stories of Jacob and of Joseph, and this is why Esau and Jacob provide so apt a typology for Paul's argument. For Esau, we must remember, is not finally rejected. The brothers are reconciled to the increase of both, precisely because of their temporary estrangement. Indeed, when they are reunited, it is Jacob who says to Esau, not the reverse, seeing your face is like seeing God's. And this is the pattern Paul explicitly invokes in his argument. In the case of Israel and the church, election has become even more literally antinomian. Christ is, in a sense, the end of the law, but precisely so that all persons may attain righteousness by effacing any difference between Jew and Gentile. Thus God blesses everyone. As for the believing remnant of Israel in 11, chapter 11, they are elected He clearly says, not as the number of the saved, but as the earnest through which all of Israel will be saved. They are the part that makes the totality holy. And again, the providential ellipticality of elections course vastly widens its embrace. For now, part of Israel is hardened, but only until the full entirety, pleroma, of the Gentiles enter in. They have not been allowed well, I should say enters in. I just realized that's a singular noun. (laughs) I'm slipping. Uh, They've not been allowed to stumble, only to fall, however. I mean, he says, have they stumbled that they might fall? No. And if their failure now enriches the world, how much more so will their, their own full entirety, pleroma, temporarily rejected for the world's reconciliation, they undergo a restoration that will be a resurrection from the dead. So this, then, is the actual radiant answer that dispels the shadows of Paul's grim what-if, the clarion negative. There is no final illustrative division between vessels of wrath and of mercy. 
God has bound everyone in disobedience so as to show mercy to everyone. All are vessels of wrath so that all may be made vessels of mercy. Now, not that one can ever apparently be explicit enough. Uh, one classic construal of Romans 11, uh, in, especially in certain traditions, is to claim that Paul's seemingly extravagant language, all full entirety, the world, the world, and so on, cosmos, really, uh, really still means just that all peoples are saved only in the exemplary or representative form of the elect, but that's just what Paul doesn't say. He's clear that it is those not called forth, those allowed to stumble, who will still never be allowed to fall. Now, if this were not so, Paul would end his contemplations in the same darkness in which he began. His glorious discovery would be redu reduced to a dreary tautology, and his magnificent vision of the vast reach of divine love would be converted into a cartoon of its squalid narrowness. Yet on the whole, the late Augustinian tradition on these texts has been so broad and mighty that it has for millions of Christians effectively evacuated Paul's argument of its actual content. Um, it seems as if I'm often attacking Calvinism and John Calvin. I'm not, it's just that when you're dealing with a topic like this, what's the more obvious straw man? Um, but I will say this. I mean, it, when, Paul, when, when John Calvin in Book 3 of the Institutes claims that God predestined even the fall, and in the commentary on 1 John uh, claims that God is not love in his essence, but only is love to those who are elect, whereas to the reprobate he could just as well and more justly perhaps be called hate, one sees the degree to which one has to move to, to accommodate what is at the end of the day a, a large, just simply a, a self-evidently deficient exegesis. And this is perhaps the grimmest paradox of Christian theological tradition on this issue, that Paul's greatest attempt to demonstrate that God's election is not a predilective ex exclusion of some class of the reprobate, but instead a providential means of unrestricted inclusion has been employed for centuries to advance quite literally the very teaching he has gone to such great lengths to reject. So, would the Christian tradition had, this is my incessant lament, my cri de coeur, my tireless refrain, heeded Gregory of Nyssa instead. How many unpleasant confusions and psychological outrages and problems for the moral Im imagination might have been avoided. As I said in my first lecture, instead of an everlasting division between the two cities of the redeemed and the reprobate, Gregory found in Paul and in the rest of the New Testament only a division between two moments within the economy of salvation, between, as I phrased it in my second lecture, two eschatological horizons. For him, the making and redemption of the world belong to the working out of one great process by which God brings to pass that perfect creation conceived and intended by him before all ages and residing eternally in his will. All time is, says Gregory, an akaluthia, akaluthia following an unfolding, um, a gradual unfolding of God's eternal design in time and by way of change. It's funny how much that little word, akaluthia, is a systematic principle in Gregory's thought on just about every issue. Uh, and hence, he argues, creation is twofold. Uh, if you remember my first lecture, I said that, uh, that his greatest, greatest eschatological treatise is actually his treatise on the creation of human, humankind. There is a prior or eternal creative act that abides in God, says Gregory, is the end towards which all things are directed, for the sake of which all things are brought about, and a posterior creative act, which is the temporal exposition of this divine model, its cosmic and historical explication. From eternity, says Gregory, God has conceived humanity in the form of the ideal human being, anthropos. This sounds very platonic at the moment. 
the archetype and perfection of the human, a creature shaped entirely after the divine likeness, neither male nor female, possessed of divine virtues, purity, love, passability, happiness, wisdom, freedom, immortality. But by this, Gregory does not mean, as we might expect, simply that God created an eternal ideal of the human after which all of us are severally fashioned. Rather, he describes that first human as comprising and as indeed being the entire pleroma of all human beings throughout all the ages from first to last. In his reading of Genesis 1, 26 to 27, Gregory understands the creation of humanity according to the divine image to refer not principally to Adam and Eve, but to this full community of humankind is comprehended by God's foresight as in a single body fashioned after the divine beauty. Adam and Eve, however, superlatively endowed with the gifts of grace at their origin, constituted for Gregory only the first members of that concrete community that only as a whole truly reflects the beauty of its creator, that exists now only in the purity of the divine wisdom, athraos, altogether in its own fullness. And that will, in the fullness of its beauty, come into being only at the end of its temporal akolothea, when it will be recapitulated in Christ. <clears throat> Here alone, in the solidarity of all humanity, has God fashioned a creature in the image and likeness of God. This is a quotation from the making of human, hum, humanity. Thus, humanity, according to the image, came into being, the entire nature, nature the God-like thing, He's careful to say that this is where the likeness of God is to be found. And what thus came into being was through omnipotent wisdom, not part of the whole, but the entire plenitude of the nature, or you could say the race, altogether. Feces could, of course, be read as race, unquote. It's precisely this full community of persons throughout time that God elects as his image, truth, glory, and delight. And God brings this good creation he desires to pass in spite of sin, both in and against human history, and never ceases telling the story he intends for creation, despite our apostasy from that story. Sin, it's true, inaugurates its own sequence, an acolithia of privation and violence spreading throughout time from its first seeds, striving against God's love. Um, but humanity, as the pleroma of God's election, still possesses that deathless beauty that humanity as an historical being has lost. And God, seeing that beauty, says Gregory, draws all things on towards the glory he intends for them, but according to a mystery, a grace that does not predetermine the operations of a human freedom that cannot elude it. Christ, for Gregory, stands in an indissoluble relation to humanity from everlasting it is the beauty of the eternal Logos after whom the first human is fashioned, to be the living body of Christ, its only head. So in entering into the plenitude of humanity as one man among men and women, and in assuming humanity's creaturely finitude and history, Christ reorients humanity again towards its true end. And because this pleroma is a living unity, the incarnation of the Logos is of effect for the whole. Christ has, one might say, assumed the pleroma, and his glory enters into all that is human. Moreover, such is the indivisible solidarity of humanity that the entire body must ultimately be in unity with its head, either the first or the last human, Adam. This is the meaning Gregory takes from John 20, 17, when Christ goes to God, to his God and Father, and to the God and Father of his disciples, he presents all of humanity to God and himself. And, and again, a throes altogether. And so Christ's obedience to the Father, even unto death, can be made complete only eschatologically when humanity gathered together in him will be yielded up as one body to the Father in the Son's act of subjection, I never liked that translation of hypotai, and God will be all in all. At Easter, Christ's resurrection inaugurated an akalutheia of resurrection, so to speak. He's in, this is uh, from one of his anti-Eunomian tracts, or his, let's say, tracts in, in uh, debate with Eunomias. 
Christ's resurrection inaugurated an aculatheia of resurrection in the one body of humanity, an unfolding that cannot now cease, given the solidarity of human nature, till the last residue of sin, the last shadow of death has vanished. Then, as his sister Macrina, <coughs> and uh, again, for those of you who don't know, I think Gregory's great teacher in his youth was in fact his sister Macrina, but we know of her only from the dialogue on the soul and resurrection. She explains to him there that all divisions will fall away, all separation of peoples into those within the temple precincts and those outside. For every barrier of sin separating human beings from the mysteries within the veil of the sanctuary will have been torn down, and there will be a universal feast around God in which no rational creature will be deprived of full participation. And thus, those who were once excluded on account of sin will enter into the company of the blessed, for there can be no true human unity, nor even any perfect unity between God and humanity, except in terms of the concrete solidarity of all persons in the complete community that alone is the true image of God. God shall be all in all, according to Gregory, not simply by comprising humanity in himself as a metaphysical premise of the human, but by way of each particular person in each unique inflection of the Pleroma's beauty. And yet, this assumption of the human unfolds only within human freedom, within our capacity to venture away. Of course, for Gregory, sin is always in some sense accidental to humanity, a privation, a disease corrupting the will, and so it is the opposite of real human freedom, ultimately to be purged, therefore, from human nature. It is, that is, sin, even if needs be by hell. <clears throat> Evil is inherently finite, indeed pure finitude, and so builds only towards an ending. It's a tale with an imminent conclusion, a history. And I'm obviously resuming the themes of yesterday's lecture. And in the light of God's infinity, its end is shown to be nothing but its own disappearance. When it is exhausted, when all shadow, chaos, hiddenness, and violence has been outstripped by the infinity of God's splendor, beauty, radiance, and delight, and God's glory will shine in each creature, I'm quoting here, like the sun in an immaculate mirror, and each soul born into the freedom of God's image will turn of itself toward divine love, there is no other place, no other liberty. At the very last, to the inevitable God, humanity is bound by its freedom. And each person, as God elects him or her from before the ages, is indispensable. He says this too in the creation of humanity. For the humanity God eternally wills could never come to fruition in the absence of any member of that body, any inflection of that beauty, apart from the one who is lost Humanity as God wills it could never be complete, nor even exist as the creature who is fashioned after the divine likeness. The loss of even this one would leave the body of the Logos incomplete, God's purpose in creation unrealized. Now, <clears throat> all of that connects uh, to yesterday's lecture and in a different way to the lecture before. Uh, but I want to ask something about it uh, that's somewhat different from Gregory's own set of questions. Um, and the first thing I'd say is I think in some degree this is something we already know, not as the result of any particular theological speculation, but just from a sober consideration of what is entailed in any coherent account of what it means to be a person. I mean, surely it would be possible for us to be saved only as individuals, only if it were possible for us to be persons as individuals. And we know we cannot be. I'm not even sure that it's possible to distinguish a single soul in isolation as either saint or sinner in an absolute sense, because it seems to me that we are all bound in disobedience, as the apostle says, precisely by being bound to one another in the sheer contingency of our shared brokenness and the brokenness of our world and our responsibility one for another. 
Consequently, I can't even say where, at what extremity of pious despair, I could draw a line of demarcation between tolerable and intolerable tales of eternal loss. Some admittedly are obviously, let's be honest, depraved. A child is born in poverty, close to the sun in lonely lands, suffers from some horrible and quite incurable congenital disease, dies in agony, and then, on some accounts consecrated by theological tradition for many centuries, descends to perpetual torment as the condign punishment for a guilt inherited from a distant ancestor, or as an epitome of divine sovereignty and election and dereliction, or whatever. Now, most of us know, I think, if we consult our conscience, consciences, we know this to be a parody of the gospel, so repugnant to both reason and conscience that even were it per impossibile true, it would be indefensible to believe it. But then, under what conditions does the language of eternal damnation really cease to be scandalous? For me, at absolutely no point whatsoever, I find. Uh, let's presume that that child, as Gregory of Nyssa believed, descends instead to eternal bliss. He wrote a whole treatise on this, on infants who die before baptism. And it goes forever into a deeper communion with God. But let us imagine also another child born on the same day, this one in perfect health who grows into a man of monstrous temperament, cruel, selfish, even murderous, and dies unrepentant, and then descends to an endless hell. Well, perhaps he chose to become what he became, conscious of the choice, and yet even then, I cannot quite forget or consider it utterly irrelevant that he was born into a ruined world in which a child can be born in poverty, suffer from some horrible and incurable congenital disease, die in agony, but even this isn't my principal point. I mean something far more radical, that there is no way in which persons can be saved as persons, except in and with all other persons. It's a point I touched on in the first lecture, but only in passing. It may seem an extravagant claim, moreover, but I regard it more as an acknowledgement of certain obvious truths about the fragility, dependency, and exigency of all that makes us who and what we are. I assume, or at least hope, that none of us is able to agree with the argument of Thomas and others that the knowledge of the torments of the damned will increase the felicity of the blessed in heaven, even if, as the more irrepressible of Thomas's apologists will always helpfully observe, and have done hundreds of times to me, he means only that the saints will derive pleasure from the contrast between their beatitude and the damnation from which they were graciously spared, and not that they will take sadistic delight in the spectacle as such. If you think about it, this is a meaningless distinction, but why debate the point? Most of us today lack the phlegm of a medieval Italian nobleman, and our tenderer consciences require something somewhat more emollient formulations. But many of our contemporaries, in their efforts to make emotional sense of a heaven forever suspended above hell's abyss, in which the bliss of the saints is undiminished by the misery of those left behind, make proposals scarcely less chilling. Uh, I recently read an evangelical apologist for the uh, more orthodox, infernalist orthodoxies, argue that it's morally correct for the saved to cease from pity for the damned because it is fruitless, just as it is forgivable to avert one's eyes from a frightful accident on the roads from which one cannot rescue the victims. To me, this read as a counsel of moral imbecility. No, I can't uh, help the victims of that accident. Neither can my pity for a little girl dying of cancer cure her. But what an atrocity of a man I would be if I ceased pitying her for that reason. And I know of another evangelical writer of the same dogmatic disposition, this one a philosopher of sorts, who uh, periodically insists on perpetrating theology who at least recognizes that indifference is not sufficiently distinct from malice to count as a genuine moral posture. And he apparently grasps that talk of a final beatitude that might involve averting one's thoughts specifically from some persons whom one has loved in the past is at the very least counterintuitive. 
He therefore proposes that to grant the saints the perfect blessedness of the kingdom, God will surely veil the sufferings of the damned from their eyes and will even perhaps elide all memory of the lost from the recollections of the saved. Think of it as a kind of celestial lobotomy, a judicious truncation or mutilation of the mind for the sake of emotional peace. Perhaps these really are our alternatives. If there is an eternal hell, the price of heavenly beatitude for those who escape it must in some large measure consist in either callousness or ignorance. Now, part of the absurdity of such arguments, of course, is simply the mundane psychologization of heaven and hell they involve. I mean, I don't know how you summon up these pictures of people stationed up here and others down there and looking at one another and trying to work it out and the somewhat burlesque effects produced whenever one attempts to imagine the unimaginable in terms of the familiar. But there's a larger and a grimmer absurdity in the moral possibilities these arguments ask us to entertain, and what those possibilities imply about the meaning of any human love. The image that this account of God's kingdom irresistibly summons up in my mind is that of a parent whose child has grown into someone quite evil, but who nevertheless still keeps and cherishes countless tender memories of the innocent and delightful being who has become lost in the labyrinth of that damaged soul. Is that all really to be consigned to the flames as so much chaff? Must it be forgotten or willfully ignored for heaven to enter into that parent's soul? And if so, is this not the darkest tragedy ever composed? And is God not then a tragedian utterly merciless in his poetic omnipotence? But then again, who exactly is that parent once those those memories have been either converted into indifference or altogether expunged? Who or what is that being whose identity is no longer determined by its relation to that child? Why are we even speaking about salvation at this point? Who remains to be saved? a spark, a spiritual essence detached from all identity, rather like the Western caricature of Advaita Vedanta's eternal Atman detached from the conditional relations of Jiva. But, uh, sorry to skirt off into one of my other fields. Sorry. The issue is not just that our identities are constituted by our memories, though of course they are, but the personhood of any of us in its entirety is created by and sustained within the loves and associations that shape us. There is no such thing as a person in separation. As I said in my first lecture, we are those others who make us. Surely this is the profoundest truth in the doctrine of resurrection. It is a claim not simply about resumed corporeality, but about the fully restored existence of the person as socially, communally, corporately constituted. For Paul, the flesh, sarks, the mortal life of the psychical body, soma psychikon, passes away, but not embodiment, not the spiritual body, which is surely not merely a local, but a communal condition. Each person is a body within the body of humanity, which exists in its proper nature, only as the body of Christ. But then where in the world does the web of associations that make us persons reach an end? For our personhood consists not only in the immediate love of those close at hand, but also those whom we, by analogy, care for from afar. For the law of charity, of love when it's truly active, is that it must inexorably grow beyond all immediately discernible boundaries in order to be fulfilled and to continue to live. And all those in whom each of us is implicated and who are implicated in each of us are themselves in turn implicated and interplicated in countless others, on and on, without limit. We belong of necessity to an indissoluble coherence of souls. In the end, a person cannot begin or continue to be a person at all, except in and by way of all other persons. Human beings are not, in the metaphysical sense, sense, substantial relations or pure acts of perichoresis, reciprocally containing one another, as the persons of the Trinity are. We're not metaphysically simple in that way, but we are so long as we are anything at all dynamic analogies of that simplicity and of that corporate identity that is, for Gregory of Nyssa, at once the human being of the first creation and also the eternal body of Christ. Which would seem to be to say that either all persons must be saved or none can be saved. 
According to the traditional picture of a dual eternity, a final division of the saved and the damned, God could, in fact, save no persons at all. He could erase each of the elect as persons, shattering their memories like the gates of hell, and then raise up some other being in each of their places, thus converting the will of each to an idiot bliss stripped of the loves that made them, stripped of associations and affinities and pity. But persons, it seems, could not be saved. They could only be damned. Only in hell could any of us possess something like a personal destiny, tormented perhaps by the memories of the loves we squandered or betrayed, but not deprived of them altogether. If that is so, perhaps it is to hell that we should want to go, but rather than suggest that, because I'm not that brave, let me begin to draw to a close. I began with that quotation from Pascal. I'll draw to another close from another, uh, I'll draw to a close with another uh, quotation from another of the great Eastern Church McDonald's, St. George MacDonald of Aberdeen. Uh, well, I'm claiming him for the Orthodox. From his magnificent unspoken sermons, and, but it's a quotation you could find written without uh, the Scottish accent. Uh, perhaps an Isaac of Nineveh or even Abba Silioan of Athos, the great 20th century saint. Quote, he's imagining looking down into hell from a position of beatitude in heaven. Who that loves his brother would not, upheld by the love of Christ and with a dim hope that in the far off time there might be some help for him, arise from the company of the blessed and walk down into the dismal regions of despair to sit with the last, the only unredeemed, the Judas of his race, and be himself more blessed in the pains of hell than in the glories of heaven. Who in the midst of the golden harps and white wings, knowing that one of his kind, one miserable brother in the old world time when men were taught to love their neighbors as themselves, was howling unheeded far below in the vaults of the creation, who, as I say, would not feel that he must arise, that he had no choice, that awful as it was, he must gird his loins and go down into the smoke and the darkness and the fire, traveling the weary and fearful road into the far country to find his brother, who I mean, who had the mind of Christ, that had the love of the Father." Unquote. This, I think, is the only true sense in which the sufferings of the damned could contribute to the beatitude of the saved by waking within them yet again and again a substitutionary love in souls whose whole being and delight consists precisely in such love. Happily, however, the descent into those depths would not actually have to be a lonely act of spiritual heroism. For the whole substance of Christian faith is the knowledge that another has already and decisively gone down into that abyss to set the prisoners free, even from their own hatred and despair. And so the love that has made all of us who we are and that will continue throughout eternity to do so cannot ultimately be rejected by anyone. And so all shall share in, as Gregory of Nyssa writes, and I'll give him the last word, as I've tried to do most of my theological career, quote, we will all share in the redeemed unity of all, united one with another by the convergence of all upon the one good in the community of all. Thank you. <clears throat> sure. <clears throat> I'm sorry my voice was a bit weaker today. Uh, I have a bit of a flare-up of the lung problem. But, but I'm happy to answer questions, uh, if, though sometimes it may just be with a scowl. So, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, please, John. First of all, thank you so much um, for being here. And uh, I unfortunately was not able to make your talk yesterday, um, so there may be something in that that you uh, might draw upon as well. But in your first uh, lecture and then in today's lecture, I um, am 
I, I, it has brought to my mind this, this connection of the Bodhisattva tradition in uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Um, and a, a difference there for me is that there's this kind of intentionality or this, this desire not to reach nirvana in order to wait for all of humanity. Uh, to reach nirvana, uh, or all of creation to reach nirvana simultaneously. Um, so I'm wondering, thinking about that and thinking about um, your framing, where the saints stand, where our forebears and our ancestors stand in relationship to this progression towards the uh, drawing into God. What is there a... Uh, a sense in which there is a, a um, commitment to waiting? Is there some sense in which they are already in a place of that mm. unity? How, how does that work as, as the enfolding into God is, is in process? Uh, yeah, for those uh, who might not recognize the reference, uh, most people do now because uh, Asian uh, references aren't quite as recherche for Western listeners as they used to be. In the Mahayana, um, the figure of the one on the way to enlightenment, the Bodhisattva, I mean, that ceases to be a term just for uh, the Buddha on his way to enlightenment. It becomes a savior figure in its own right, one who has effectively achieved full enlightenment and uh, could enter into Nibbana or Nirvana, uh, but who takes the Bodhisattva vow, which is most beautifully described by Shantideva in the, in the Bodhicharya Vatara, of course. But, but the, um, the vow is not to uh, enter in to the final bliss until all others enter before him. Um, and actually, I've thought about that, uh, relay, the, the question of Christ and the Bodhisattva. In fact, I have about 10 times have started uh, an article called Christ Among the Bodhisattvas that I've never finished. Um, uh, obviously, in Christian thought, the figure who discharges that <laughs> role is Christ. Um, you know, so we don't think in, in, in those terms generally, but, um, you know, uh, for instance, George MacDonald, the, phrase, the, the passage from George MacDonald is echoed somewhat in a saying from Abba Silyawan about the, about the impossibility of, of ceasing to pray for the salvation of all so long as one soul is in torment and that we can never, you know, that we could never fully bear this. Love could not bear this. Um, and uh, there's a... Um, famous Orthodox theologian um, who was the, uh, the student, the, the disciple of Siliwan and a great spiritual leader himself, Abba Safrani, who said just this, so long as there is one soul in hell, Christ is there with him. You know, there's a long tradition of this, going to that. Unattribu it's often attributed to origin. We don't know if Origen said it or someone else and it became part of the tradition that, that Christ isn't suffering, suffers until the end of time. But I mean, it's, it's said in such a way as to mean until the end of uh, all alienation. I'll, I'll say this. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, part of my thinking on this from a very early po point was in fact uh, uh, inspired by the very question of the Bodhisattva vow, you know, that's the, and um, Shantideva's treatise especially, even when I was in my teens, when I studied, started studying Asian religions. I remember also uh, this purely anecdotal, reading the story, the famous, well, among the, the legends of the Desert Fathers, the story of Abba Macarius coming on a human skull, and the skull tells him what it's like in hell. Um, and how, <clears throat> He, uh, he begs uh, Abba Macarius to pray for those in hell every day because he says, when, when we are remembered by, the, by, by uh, those of you who pray for us, for a moment we're allowed to turn and see one another's faces. But otherwise in hell we see only the backs of one another's heads. Now, 
For one thing, I was impressed by the beauty of that notion that seeing the face of the other is heaven even in the place of, even in the heart of hell. But the other thing that struck me is why Alba Macarius, who goes away in pity, great pity, shaken with pity, why his pity seemed to be so greater than God's uh, in the story, so much greater. Um, uh, I think the image of the Bodhisattva is a testimony to Christians of how they should think about the image of Christ fully understood. Great, um, Kathy Grieve. One question every night, I think. Um, just on that same point, I think it's really right at the heart of what you're saying. I, and I wonder if you're interested in two parts of the uh, Christian tradition that seem to me to be relevant. One is the idea that the glory of the temple departs and goes with Israel into exile. Yeah. And the other is the idea in Hebrew, at the end of Hebrews 11 um, about all of those great um, patriarchs and matriarchs before us who God makes wait until the very last generation, I think Hebrews believed that that was then, yeah. um, are, are allowed to, so that everybody is, is, uh, is together. I, I wonder if you think they're, I mean, it's not the same thing, but... I, but no, but I think uh, it is. In many, I mean, and not the same thing, obviously, I don't know. But, um, I mean, much of, um, I mean, Orthodox Judaism is a place where you find this language most of the departure of the Shekhinah and of the, of the glory, and, and, you know, drawing on the Exodus narratives of the glory of God traveling with the, the children of Israel in Exodus, then becomes the story of how the glory of God in the wake of the destruction of the temple stays uh, with the body of the children of Israel wherever they wander. Um, this is very much part of that aspect of um, uh, Kabbalah or Lyrionic Kabbalah that is shared by all Orthodox Judaism on the, the notion of tikkun, the salvation of the cosmos, the redemption, the, the restoration, the apocatastasis and the way in which the unique and precious priestly uh, privilege of keeping the law is a way in which all are contributing uh, without surcease so long as the world abides in the tikkun of all things. And so, I mean, I think there's, again, that, that notion of a, of a, of, um, a refusal to cease um, and, uh, uh, and an orientation towards a universal horizon of perfect reconciliation. Um, so, you know, I mean, again, it's another source of my thinking is, in fact, just that aspect of or or orthodox Jewish tradition. So. Give the last question to the dean. I'll ask you over dinner, but... Um, the argument that you framed, which I found completely compelling and persuasive, uh, the image resides in community and redemption therefore has the implication of, of full inclusion of, of all. Um, can you just sketch out the implications for the non-human realm? And in what way can uh, that argument apply? Because of course that's the other part of the Christian tradition on the whole, it's not only that you know it's, a small minority make it, the elect make it into heaven, and the rest of humanity's damned, but a complete indifference to non-human realm of cats and dogs and right and so on. Well, I mean, it's, it's it's hard to get fourth-century Greeks to pay attention to these things. I've tried, uh, but I mean, you know, uh, the the notion of at this period the eschatological language still remains fixed in the biblical language of a restored creation. Uh, the exact details are not laid out, but I mean, what, what, they always talk in terms of the redemption of the cosmos, not just meaning the ecumeny, not just the inhabited world, but this, this transfiguration. Now, the, I find that the Syrian church fathers are better on these issues just because of the you know, the way Ephraim's hymnody uh, is just absolutely saturated in the, in the goodness and beauty of the natural world. And then the images of the kingdom, as in scripture, are full of all of these things as well, uh, released from the death that we visited upon them. 
you know, the, you know, the bondage. We, or Isaac of Nineveh speaking about uh, the compassion that makes for the merciful heart, which is the saved heart, doesn't stop with the human. He talks about you know, pitying the poor reptiles in the desert, uh, pitying the demons, you know, pity, you know, just overflowing with tears of love for all of creation. Um, but I assume that, that uh, you know, the people who've given me the hardest time on that, I have to say, are certain species, <laughs> is not the way to put it, a certain faction of traditional Thomists um, who really do take the, I'm afraid in the Middle Ages as a rule, everyone is guilty of this, not Thomas alone, but Bonaventure, anyone you can name, of thinking in terms of, of, uh, of a resurrection that is worldless almost and of a final bliss that is uh, so cast in terms of rational contemplation of the divine essence that it can be stated with absolute finality that all of animal and vegetal creation will be destroyed, that it's destined for non-being. That's what Thomas says. It's of its nature, temporary. But uh, one of the things I find so uh, attractive about uh, the Eastern, earlier Eastern tradition, is it is still grounded in the language of cosmic redemption, even when, as is often the case with these very Greek, fourth century Greeks, they don't talk about it very much. Uh, and there I find the Syrian tradition richer uh, and fuller and, and, uh, and more, uh, more biblical, actually, in the language it uses. But of course, we're all one big church, the Antiochenes, the Greeks, we, you know. <laughs> so we defer there. Um. Thank you. As in uh, the last two previous evenings, please uh, make yourself welcome to the refreshments that are provided for you outside and um, continue to contemplate the words that we've hear heard here tonight. Thank you oh, thank for you. your thank you lyrical, deep reflection on the act of creation through the eschaton, both seen in light of the other. We truly are in your debt. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, please join me in thanking David Bentley Hart. Thank you. Thank you.